I could be totally off center. I don't even know it. I don't even care because new EDS specifications are here. I'm gonna jump into the new diagnostic criteria for hypermobile EDS, just because that's something I have, so I can test it out in front of you right now and talk you through it. So let's get started on this. The two major criteria set up in 1997 were skin involvement, like hyperextendability and or smooth velvety skin, and generalized joint hypermobility. Now generalized joint hypermobility is criteria number one, so that is still around, that is still kicking, we'll talk about that in a sec, but they have completely taken out skin involvement as a major criteria, which is hugely important because that's actually the reason that I was not diagnosed with EDS for so long. People would see me, Google EDS, and be like, oh, it's the thing with the stretchy skin, and I don't have the stretchy skin. So they'd be like, well, I mean, you have literally every other symptom, but uh, I don't, uh, no stretchy skin, and that's what Google says, so bye. Ha, I do have EDS. I don't care what my skin tells you. Blah. Criterion one for hypermobility EDS is joint hypermobility, which makes a lot of sense. This is measured by the Byte score, which is the same way that things used to be. However, language has been updated to be more inclusive. So whereas it used to just say a Byte score of six or more, or five or more, whatever the old standard was, now it reads as follows. For prepubescent children and adolescents, they need a score of six or higher. Men and women post-puberty up to age 50, so like me, need a score of five or higher. And men and women older than 50 just need a four or higher. So this is because Joints can stiffen more as time goes on. Therefore, someone who has EDS might not have the Byton score of someone who has EDS because of their age. I'm gonna walk you through the Byton score right now. The Byton score is a nine point system. I'm gonna make a minute or less video on this eventually, but I'll just rock you through it real quickly right now. I won't be able to show you the leg part really, but uh, I can sure try. The first four points are all on your phalanges, dancing phalanges, anyways. Now we're gonna come from your pinkies and your thumb. Your pinky, you just have to get it back 90 degrees. Now, I'm very hypermobile. Some of us can go further. Reminder that these kind of party tricks are not great for your joints, so you should not make a habit of doing them regularly. I'm just doing this as a demonstration. So that on each hand, at least 90 degrees or further, is your, is your first two points. So I'm already two out of nine. The next is being able to fold your thumb down and touch your wrist. This is a more common one that people can do. I also happen to be able to do it that way. I'm sorry, I like showing off my party tricks. I know I'm not supposed to, I'm such a bad influence. Please don't listen to me. Um, but I, I also have it on my other hand, so that's four. The next five come from everywhere else. First being your arms. I don't know how much of this is in the shot, but my arms do form more than a 180 degree angle when extended, meaning that they are in fact hypermobile. So, Already I'm at six out of nine, so that is enough for me to fulfill this criteria, but I'm gonna keep going. The next one has to do with your legs, and it is the same thing as the arms, but if your legs can extend further than 180 degrees, which mine also do, I can't show you because I can't move the camera off the tripod, but just trust me on this one, it ain't pretty. You can ask anyone I work with. And then the last one is being able to touch your hands to the floor. Which I can also do, because yay, my life is fun. I'm in pain all the time, but sure is worth it to be flexible. I'm kidding, it sucks. Anyways, moving on to criterion two. Criterion two for hypermobile EDS reads as follows. Two or more of the following features. So that's A and B, B and C, or A and C. And this is where things get a little complicated because it's broken up into three sections, A, B, and C. A is the systemic manifestations of a more generalized connective tissue disorder. So that's gonna be symptoms you see that have to do with connective tissue that aren't necessarily your joints. I'll go over that more in detail in a moment. B, positive family history. So someone close to you who also has a clinical diagnosis of hypermobile EDS. I don't have that. So I need to fulfill A and C for, to keep my EDS diagnosis. C is musculoskeletal complications. So. I will go into more detail and define those momentarily. Feature A is systemic manifestations of a more generalized connective tissue disorder. Systemic manifestations of a more generalized connective tissue disorder are also gonna be things like easy bruising. Now, I bruise incredibly easy. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to show you this or if this will show up, 
but I have this bright green bruise on my leg right now. It's so beautiful. Look at it. It's so pretty and green. Yeah, so that kind of stuff all counts. There are also these, I learned about this new symptom today. When I stand with my feet flat on the floor, that in my back in my ankle, it almost looks like there are these white bumps in my ankle. I've never noticed it before until this wonderful lady Kendra on her live stream pointed it out in her. And I have it too. And if you have a connective tissue disorder, you may have it too. That's what is considered a systemic manifestation of a more generalized connective tissue disorder. So all sorts of things like that. There are also different ways that your thumb can move naturally, like without help that can show it also. This is sometimes called hitchhiker's thumb, but I believe here it's being referred to as the Steinberg and Walker signs. But there are also, there's also your arm span ratio that can qualify you also if your arm span to height ratio is greater than 1.05. Also things like mitral, mitral valve prolapse, mild or greater based on a strict echocardiological criteria. All sorts of things, all sorts of long words I can't pronounce, but I will be posting all of this information in the description down below, so please go and research it yourself. I can't just relay it all right now because it's 14 articles worth, which is so exciting. I'm just trying to get through what I can. Now this is where we start to deal with comorbidities. Comorbidities is other disorders that tend to coexist or correlate with other disorders. For example, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is thought to have a comorbidity with Chiari malformation, mast cell, and POTS. All three of those things are, however, unproven. This is the section I believe the comorbidities will eventually come into play, but there is not enough research backing that up yet. So this feature, feature A, is a very sparse section at the moment. It's only the things that they can prove are because of EDS based on research. As they get more research into EDS, they will be able to include comorbidities and things like that. So that is eventually where things like POTS, things like Chiari will be indicative of a more generalized connective tissue disorder. So that is an area I suspect we'll see great improvement in the coming year. Feature B is a positive family history. This is a fairly simple one. It just is one or more first degree relatives independently meeting the diagnostic criteria for ATDS. That's pretty, that's pretty easy. There's not much else I can say about that except that it can be difficult if you're someone like me because this is a gene mutation, meaning at some point the gene does have to, it has to come from somewhere, there always has to be a first person, which is why it's not a requirement, it's just one of the criteria you can check. So don't be alarmed if you are not in a family full of zebras. I myself am the only zebra in my family, it does happen, it's okay. That's where Criterion C comes into play. Criterion C is the musculoskeletal complications. So one of the following. Muscular skeletal pains in two or more limbs recurring daily for at least three months. Try constantly for my whole life. Chronic widespread pain for three or more months. Again, try my whole life. And recurrent joint dislocations or frank joint instability in the absence of trauma. So basically if your joints dislocate or sublax a lot, that's gonna be this kind of thing, which, you know, mine do, so yay, yippee ki yay. Here are some prerequisites required under Criterion 3. Absence of unusual skin fragility, which should prompt consideration for other types of EDS. Exclusion of other heritable or acquired connective tissue disorders, including autoimmune rheumatologic conditions. Now, it is possible to have both an autoimmune disorder and Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. What this is saying is that lots of connective tissue disorders show all the same symptoms. So if you already have a really solid diagnostic somewhere else, it is possible that you have symptoms of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, but it's still caused by this other thing. So this isn't necessarily saying that you can't have more than one thing, because obviously that's not how the human body works. It's just saying that you need to consider where your symptoms are coming from, since these are very general symptoms that can be caused by lots of things. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Zombie Zebra, this is Zombie Zoology, and once all of this hubbub is said and done, I will get back to the regularly scheduled programming. But for now, I think the most important thing is informing the community about this exciting scientific step forward for all of us. So please be excited with me. Please leave any questions you have in the comments down below and I will answer them as quickly as I can.